My name is Barry Bernstein. Today is May 10th, 2011, and I'm in Lexington, Tennessee to interview William L. Barry. I'm a substitute interviewer, pinch hitting for Justice Lyle Reed, who was called away. I will be assisted by Dan Pomeroy, Chief Curator and Director of Collections at the Tennessee State Museum. You will hear Dan's voice as we explore Mr. Barry's political career. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Good afternoon, Mr. Barry. Would you tell us your full name? William Logan Barry. And what's your date of birth? February the 9th, 1926, 11.30 a.m. Were you born in a hospital? Were you born at home? Born at home. Everybody was in those days. And where were you born? Lexington, Tennessee. Which is where we are today. That is just, we're in the area near Lexington, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. and your name is William, your first name is William, but I believe you have a nickname. Indeed I do. My nickname is Dick. Would you like to know the reason for it? I sure would. My grandfather, who was born in 1857, was William Thomas Logan. They called him Dick. I checked the census record for 1870. He was listed as Dick Logan. I never knew why. I still don't know why. But it's a very convenient device to determine who is one's friend and who is one's acquaintance. If they call me Dick or William, they know my name. If they call me Richard or Bill, they do not know my name. I have used it to great advantage through the years. I see. So was it your parents who determined that they were going to call you Dick? Actually, it was a neighbor next door who was 85 years old and whose husband had been a major in the Confederate Army. Everybody listened to her. And did she know your grandfather who had been called Dick? Oh, yes, of okay. course. So she determined. Her late husband and my grandfather were both lawyers here. I see. All right, so, so tell me about your grandparents. Why don't you tell me about your paternal grandparents? My paternal grandfather was William Valentine Barry, born 1858, died in 1948, was the publisher of the Lexington Progress newspaper which my father continued, and I continued on after his death, and later sold. His wife, my grandmother, was Mary Ann Denison, who lived in Decatur County at Perryville, and whose father operated a hotel there for many years. My maternal grandfather, as I said before, was William Thomas Logan, a lawyer here, who was born in 1857 and died in 1894. His wife was Celestia Fielder, whose father was a merchant here. My grandmother Logan was born in 1862 and died in 1945. They were simple, middle class, semi-professional people, and were always, those I knew, were always kind and considerate to me. I cherish that memory. And so your mother grew up in what city? or what town? Lexington. And your father grew up in? South Hello, Tennessee, in Hardin County. So how did they meet? Heaven only knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, when they did meet, did they, did they marry and set up housekeeping in Lexington? My grandparents were married in April of 1883, and they did set up housekeeping in her parents' house. Is this your parents or your grandparents? My grandparents. I believe your question was my grandparents. Actually, it was about your parents, but... Oh, my parents, okay. My father and mother met here. They both were reared here. Okay. And uh, lived happily ever after. So they met here and married here and lived in Lexington. That is correct. Do you have siblings? I do not. So you were an only child? Yes, with all its advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of your grandparents did you know? Three. And they were here as well. Oh, yeah. So you had close relations with them. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, where did you go to school? Where was elementary school? Started in Lexington Elementary School in 1931. 
graduated there in 1939, entered high school, actually high school in 1939, graduated in 1943, went to Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt Law School for the next intervening seven years. Whoa, you're getting ahead of me. Uh, I'm curious, when you were a child, did you live more in the city than you are living now, more in the town? We, One block from the courthouse. One block from the courthouse, okay. Um, so you went to high school here, and then there was the opportunity to go to college. Did you consider where to go? Oh, yes, of course. And, mm -hmm. and why did you choose Vanderbilt? What else did you think about? It was a good school. Um, some of my friends had gone there, and it was close to home. And I wanted to be there, close to home. I was only 17 when I entered college. Uh, I had been accepted by the University of Virginia, but it wasn't close to home. Mm -hmm. And so how did you get to Vanderbilt? Did you drive? Was there a train? How did, how did one get from this? In those days we had a train. Really? It continued until the mid-60s, and I used it uh, during those years. And later, later, when I became a bit older, I drove back and forth most every weekend. Did you uh, live in a dorm on campus? No, I had private quarters. As a freshman? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? No roommate? I had a roommate in the private apartment that I had, yes. Someone you knew or someone? Oh, yes. Someone from here named Herman Smith died recently. And so you went off to Vanderbilt, a boy from a not very populous county, a small town, what did you encounter when you got to Vanderbilt? What did you think of your classmates? They were nice, respectful people. There was always a group at Vanderbilt which considered themselves heir to the Vanderbilt tradition. And uh, they did not neither know nor care uh, where Lexington was. But I got along well with everybody. And though I'm not congenial by nature, I made friends and I found it a rewarding experience. Uh, were you involved in any extracurricular activities? Not officially. <laughs> you, you didn't join any clubs, is that what you're telling me? No. And no fraternity? No fraternities. I've never, never been in favor of fraternities. Why is that? I don't know. It creates, in my opinion, a clannishness and exclusiveness which is not salubrious or solitary. Okay. Uh, did you ever attend a Vanderbilt football game? Not if I could avoid it. Did you go to a football game in high school? Not if I could avoid it. How about any other sports? Basketball? Not if I could avoid okay, it. Okay, not a sports fan? Not, not at all. Okay. Um, did you take advantage of any of, of the things that the city of Nashville had to offer off campus? Was there anything about Nashville that intrigued you as a big city? I like the bus line. Well, where did it take you? Downtown. And when you got downtown, you went shopping? Uh, no, I went to the state capitol every chance I got. Now, now why was that? Because I love politics, was interested in government above and, everything else. And I thought in an early age that I'd learned something about it. Were, were you involved in politics before you went off to college? Did it, were you aware of politics in Henderson County? I listened carefully to the election returns in the presidential election for 1932 when I was six years old. I've never quit. Were you uh, inclined to uh, a particular party? Democratic, of course. Why? Hmm. The entire family always had been. Uh, the old traditions die hard. Our background was with uh, the Confederate armies during the Civil War. And certain forces had not come into being then, which now have drastically changed the political outlook. But you, you were always inclined toward the Democratic Party. So there you are at Vanderbilt in the state capitol, and you would finish your classes, which I'm sure you attended assiduously, and then take the bus downtown and hang out at the Capitol? And in the movie theaters. In the movie theaters. Okay, we got a movie fan. All right. Um, so what did you major in at Vanderbilt? English literature. 
Did you think that would assist you in any career, or is that what intrigued you? I liked English literature. Okay. Um, what did you do? Do you remember what you did on in your summers between years in college? How did did you work? Did you have summer jobs? Did you travel? Oh heavens, no! I didn't work anywhere. No, I didn't travel much. I simply enjoyed the warm weather in the summertime. And came back to Lexington. Oh sure. Okay. <laughs> so when you're a senior in college, knowing that college is about to end, you're about to graduate. What were your thoughts about what to do next? Get into politics. I had an intervening period there, which I served in the military for two years in Japan. Uh, did you go to law school post-college, though? Oh, yes, I went down. Well, so I'm curious, when you were a senior in college, did, did you know at that time you wanted to go to law school, or did you consider any other career? It seems to me that they had a program they called Senior in Absentia. If you attended a professional school at Vanderbilt, they would reduce your regular liberal arts course by one year. I wanted to get out of college for that year. That was one reason why I went to law school. Others were family influences and background. Was your lawyer grandfather still alive at that time? No. Okay. but. And had you known him or not? No. Okay. Um, so you decided to go to law school. Did you uh, have to take the LSAT to get into law school? No. And no standardized test. Don't believe it had it. No. no. So how how did you get into law school? Did you just appear at the registrar's office? No, we just gave him a check and they let you in. <laughs> So you went straight from undergrad to law school? Correct. Okay. Um, and where was the law school held? Where were the classes held? I believe on the second floor of Kirkland Hall, which is a, a good part of the campus in those days. Uh, do you have any idea how many people were in your class? It was a large post-war class, many veterans under the GI Bill, so-called. I would say a hundred, maybe. There it was any, a lot. Were there any women in your class? Two, as I recall. Do you remember their names? I can see their faces in my mind, but okay. I don't remember. All right. One was Cowan, I believe. Bonnie Cowan? I believe that's correct, yeah. I had a husband who was a lawyer. Uh, who was the other? And another one married a football player up there. Named Wade, I believe. Was the football player Bill Wade? Could be. Mm -hmm. I could well have forgotten now. Um, so you did three years of law school. That's correct. Uh, were your extracurricular activities the same, leaving campus as soon as you could to get down to the state capitol? Exactly the same. Okay. And when you got to the capitol, what did you do? Oh, various things. Visited acquaintances. I'm sure I was a bit of a nuisance sometimes. Walked around over the building, looked out across the city of Nashville, went in the library quite often, did some research and reading, and uh, simply enjoyed the atmosphere. Uh, nowadays, someone like you could probably get a job uh, as an intern in a legislator's office doing whatever they told you to do, making copies, getting coffee, helping out. Was that, an oper was that a possibility? I would never have considered it. Because? I didn't like that sort of thing. Okay. okay. Did you attach yourself to any particular members of the legislature? Yes. Mm -hmm. who? I don't remember who they were. Whoever <laughs> thought I could be, could be useful to me at that time. Uh, did did the um, representatives from your hometown or from Henderson County know you were there? Were those people of particular interest to you or not? He would not have wanted to know I was there. Okay. Uh, so, you finished law school. Did you intend to practice law? No, not really. Never did. Did you take the bar exam when you finished I did. law school? 
Where do you know where that was held? Oh yeah, state capitol. And and did you do any review course before it? We didn't have those in those days. No. I know I, I, I wasn't aware of it if it did. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so you took the bar exam. Did you sweat the results? Were you worried? Well, I recall when I found out the results in the National Banner one afternoon, I was eating a hamburger at a West Point restaurant in Baldwin West End, and I found I'd passed. I was surprised, and I was gratified, and I was relieved. Uh, that was my, those were my reactions, I suppose. Did you celebrate? Well, you'd have to define the word. <laughs> Something other than a hamburger. It was not a hamburger, <laughs> believe me. So you passed the bar exam, and you'd finished schooling. You could you could point to an accomplishment, and uh, what was next on your horizon? Military. How old were you at that point? Do you remember? Of course, I remember. I was twenty-four. And it was what year? Nineteen fifty. And what? What responsibility did you have, or did you have a, was there an obligation to the military? Well, I was inducted, yeah. Was there a draft? Mm-hmm, there sure was. Okay. Um, was the nation at war or at peace? The uh, Korean War was in progress. And there was a draft? Yes. And you were 24 mm -hmm. years old? Mm -hmm. Is that 24? Um, so you went ahead and you were drafted, and yeah. wh where, what, what happens next after you are inducted? You immediately try to get a commission, which I did and had no difficulty. I was given an officer's commission not long after my induction. And is that based on the fact that you had a graduate degree? I'll never know. They put me in the Medical Service Corps. <laughs> so where did you go? Fort Jackson, South Carolina, like everybody does. I bet it was hot. A bit warm, sandy too, a lot of pine trees. And did they train you to do something? Not that I was ever aware of. Did they try to train you to do something? No, I just made up my mind to do something. And what did I you do? I wanted that commission. Well, I learned to keep the books in the hospital in Yokohama and uh, do some other things. Well, so. To handle court martials and such as that. So, wait a minute. You, you're. You're, you've been sent to South Carolina, mm -hmm. and then, and how did you, how, you've jumped from South Carolina to Yokohama. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, in between, I went to San Antonio, Texas, and San Francisco. And then, in September of 1951, I went to Yokohama. Uh, my duties were not clearly defined in the interim. And Yokohama is in what country? Japan. Okay. I'm, I'm asking questions for posterity. My here. dear lady, I'm sure you knew where you were going. <laughs> but I want you to answer the question. I understand. Uh, so you were sent to Japan. How did you get to Japan? On a ship. No, How well, long? no they didn't fly us in those days. Six days, as I recall. Only six days? By Hawaii. Uh, oh. Yeah, that was. I had officers' quarters, far more comfortable than some of the others. I'm a great believer in comfort. And luxury were available. I'm going to write that line down. Uh, and when you got to Yokohama, what, what was your duty? I was assigned to the 8168th Army Unit, which was a converted building, which had made, been made into an Army Unit headquarters. I had diverse and several different jobs. Payrolls, court martials, bookkeeping, which I got someone else to do, and uh, clerical things like that. Was it tough duty? No. Very, I was fortunate. It was a very satisfactory time in life. And how long were you there? 18 months. Did you travel? Oh, yes. Where did you go? Well, one could rent a car and a driver for 25 cents an hour in those days. And I went all over Japan, except Hokkaido, the northernmost island. I went to Shitoku, uh, of course Kyushu, and uh, other places. Enjoyed 
all of the unusual and to me unique uh, qualities of Japanese life, and I hope learn something about a country which had so recently been a mortal enemy of our own. How were you perceived by the Japanese? I'll never know. Did anyone ever spit on you? Did anyone ever indicate uh, ill will toward an American walking around? I assume you were in uniform? Sometimes, not, it wasn't required, except when you were on duty, of course. I was never insulted, abused, slandered, or otherwise mistreated and all the time I was in Japan. I made friendships with some of the outstanding people in Japan, and they were always most considerate and helpful and hospitable, which many people do not think they are. Now, I've driven around your um, home here today, and there are stands of bamboo. Does that, does your interest in bamboo or in planting bamboo uh, have any connection to the time you spent in Japan? Oh, I think it definitely does, yes. So yeah. how long ago did you plant that bamboo? Well, that's another. I got back to Japan in 1953. Later I found that I might have a serious illness. And I decided that my heirs, who appeared then would come on the scene, would have to deal with the invasiveness of bamboo, and I would not. <laughs> so I set out bamboo. It's been about 10, 12 years ago. And I have survived, and so has the bamboo. So, but to answer your question, yes, ma'am, it uh, definitely was a factor. I love the sound of the wind and the bamboo. I love to watch the swaying of the branches. And above all, the fact it's such a durable and utilitarian plant, and one which uh, would uh, be well to be developed and cultured in other parts of the world. Uh, did you pick up souvenirs in Japan? What did you bring back to your family or for yourself? Oh, this and that. Small things, nothing of any great consequence. Bric-a-brac of various sorts. And, and what's your, what is your feeling about the time you spent in the military? Did you learn anything valuable? Very many valuable things. One is never pass the food until you've had, had a piece yourself. Another is that uh, it's far better to be an officer than not. And another is that you're taught certain disciplines that you would not otherwise have the opportunity to learn. And above all, you see other parts of the world, which helps in one way, I guess, to bring people closer together and make them recognize their mutual characteristics and virtues. What would you, um, do you have an opinion about whether universal military service would be useful in this country? I do not think that it would at this point. It certainly has been in the past and may well be again. But I would not recommend it, as in many foreign countries, as compulsory. Because? I do not think a democracy in principle can subject itself to compulsory uh, regimentation in any regard, even the Rotary Club. Uh, so when you, you said you were in Japan for 18 months, and that was the end of your um, obligation? Yeah. OK. And they put you on a ship and send you home? No, I put myself on a ship and came back around the other way and went around the world on the way home. If I paid the expense, it was agreeable to the government. In those days, they had some occasional qualm of conscience, and they tried to save money, ha ha. By they, you mean the United they States government? They didn't have to pay my way back. Uh -huh. So when you say you went the other way, where does that mean you stopped off? Oh, Hong Kong, India, Egypt, Belgium, Italy. Germany, France, Spain, England, Scotland, Ireland, New York. How long did that take? Two months. Did you 
arrive in a city and leave a city when you felt like it, or did you plot out days? Well, I had, I had a tour. You did? Uh, cost $2,000, everything. Were, Transportation, lodging, food. And were you by yourself, or were you Two with friends me? with me. One from Ohio and one from uh, Mississippi. Gentlemen friends. Uh-huh. Sounds like fun. Oh, all right. And we're now many years later. Have you been back to those places? Some of them. Have you gone back to Japan? Oh, yes. Five times, I think. Not since nine, since 72, I think, was the last time I was there. Is, is Japan a place you'd ever given much thought to prior to being sent there in the military? No, not really. But yet you found a place you enjoyed and appreciated. Delightful place. Uh, maximum utilization of all the resources, agriculture and otherwise. No waste. Uh, incredible industry and enterprise. Excellent food. Uh, and in those days, certainly congenial and a warm-hearted people. I do not refer to the days of the unfortunate war. So you came back the other way, as you mentioned, came around the other way, and, and, and came back to the United States, a, a boy from Lexington who now literally seen the world. Where did you go? Nashville. Didn't, didn't, didn't want to make your way in Lexington, Tennessee? Well, I came back to Lexington, but I went to the legislature in Nashville as soon as I could. Did you um, ever set up a law office? A friend and I had a partnership, but uh, he did most of the practice. Here in town? Yes. And he got most of the proceeds. I had certain other sources of income. So was that immediately after your your time in the military? In 1953. So 1953 you had a friend who you set up a practice with in Lexington or at least in in name. Did it did the partnership have a name? Barry and Walker. And who was who was Walker? Charlie Walker. His widow lives in the house right next door to me here. Okay and he was someone you'd grown up with? No he was from Perry County. Perry County. Definitely did not grow up with him. Okay. What was he doing in Lexington? Practicing law. Did he precede you in the practice? No, we went in together. He married a young lady here. And I'd uh, gone to Cumberland, I believe, at uh, the law school. Uh, we never had any problem. We entered into certain business transactions together, among other things. And uh, I did some office practice, but I find that I did not enjoy law as much as I'd hoped to, and I did not uh, make it a primary enterprise. So you've recognized that you, you're, you, you've had the education, you've taken the bar exam, you're licensed, you've got a partner, you've got an office in, on the court square, I assume, on the court and, square. and you're not enjoying it very much. You have it correct. All right, so. There's a great big world out there. What did you figure was an opportunity for you? I wanted to go to Nashville in the legislature. Did you want to be a member of the legislature or to work in or around it? I wanted to be in charge of it. In charge of it. So what is the title of the person who's in charge of the legislature? Well, it depends on whether it's the Senate or the House. It would be a speaker in both cases. And. <clears throat> and, and how does one become speaker? You have to be elected first, correct? Elected. Well, of course, you have to be elected to the legislature, right. then you have to be elected speaker. The various and sundry things, in those days, the support of the governor was very important. Less so now. But the governor would never recommend anybody for office if the legislator did not want the individual. Now, his leadership was frequently listened to and respected. But uh, there were some sundry methods whereby one becomes speaker, into which I would not care to go into great detail. Okay, but to be speaker, you have to be a member of oh, yes, the legislature. Right. In so, Tennessee, you do. Yeah. So, 
So here you are, this 20-something. Oh, no, I've aged a little since you asked me the last question. All right, so how old are you now? <laughs> 85. Well, no, how old? <laughs> <laughs> How uh, you you came back to, to 20, Lexington? 29. 20, okay, so you were in your 20s. So you're 29 years old, and you want to be a member of the legislature. That's right. So, how did you do it? Who, first of all, what I mean, you have a senator and a, a, a member of the House of Representatives. So, yes, who uh, were those people at the time when you were 29 years old? Itching let's see. It to seems the places. senator was Brooks McLemore from Jackson. And my predecessor here was Joseph Murphy. Uh, I went to see Joe before I announced. He said, I don't want to go up there again. He said, I got terribly confused. He said, I made a date to see two women at the Hermitage Hotel at the same time. Aha, uh -huh, well, I tried. <laughs> um, so you, you went to the member of the legislature, the member of the House for this area. Who was he? Was it just this county, or was it a, or no? It was a smaller part of this county. What area? Well, that requires some explanation, for too long an explanation rather. Henderson and Madison County, that is Jackson, <coughs> were jointly in a flotilla district, with an understanding that since Madison County had their own members, this uh, man, by gentleman's agreement, would come from Lexington. That was because Lexington and Henderson County were Republican, and we wanted to elect a Democrat. It's called gerrymandering. And that's how I got there, of course. So you went to the current member and said, I'm going to run. Oh, no. I said, Joe, uh, do you want to run again? <laughs> Knowing he didn't, of course. Well, but anyway, now that's more or less what happened. And so at age 29, you announced you were going to run for the House. Yeah. Okay. But you're right. Did you have any opposition? No. No. Did you campaign? Well, lackadaisically, I guess would be a good expression. I didn't want to campaign too much that so people would get in the habit of respecting it. Did you have buttons with your name on them? Oh, no. Did you have yard signs? No. Did you kiss babies? Oh, no. No. Did you make speeches on the court square? If I was asked to do so, I did. Not on the court square. All right. But you, you had no opposition, so you were in, in essence. Well, that's putting it rather bluntly, but that's correct, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you were elected to the House, and what House district was it? Do you know the, what's no, what the... No, I was 28th, I believe. I can never remember. Okay. So you're elected to the... Tennessee General Assembly, member of the House, That's right. at the ripe age of 29 or 30. And no, you, 29. 29. And you? 28. 28 was. Yeah, 94. 54. Elected in 54 and started serving in 55. Okay. And you went to Nashville to be, to participate. When did the legislature meet? When during the year? January. Um, and did it meet, uh, right now, I believe they meet Monday night through Thursday midday. More or less the same time, uh, Monday nights and Thursday afternoons and all in between. And when you got there, <coughs> were there, you're a Democrat, you're from a rural area, you can align yourself with the party, you could align yourself with other rural representatives. Uh, there may have been other types of factions. Did you sit back and look around and see who was doing what and what met your fancy, or did you align yourself with someone immediately? The first session I was in, I never took the floor. I never said a word. I wanted to learn. And the worst thing a member can do is to get up and start talking as soon as he gets elected. I talked, but quietly. Uh, who was governor at that time? Frank Clement. And uh, who were who was the senator from who your district was in what senator's area? Brooks McLemore Brooks from McLemore. Jackson. Okay. Um, I've heard it said 
that there were different factions in the Democratic Party and one group stayed in one hotel in Nashville and the other group stayed in another hotel. Is, is, do you know to what I'm referring? Among those who stayed in hotels, that was true. Okay. Who stayed in which hotel? I'll have 99 of them to give you and I can't list them all. Well, <laughs> uh, was there a Clement faction that stayed? Oh yes, of course there was. A uh, Clement faction it usually stayed in the Hermitage. And they, we could call it a Browning faction. That Browning was the man that Clement beat in 1952. Uh, the Browning people stayed to Andrew Jackson, so did I. Because I preferred to Andrew Jackson. Well, I was a Clement supporter. So there were exceptions. There were no, no hard and fast rules. Did that give you the opportunity to hear things in the elevator? And elsewhere. Yeah. So, it, it, so it, it, you liked the accommodations, but you, it also uh, helped you politically. It didn't hurt. Okay. All right. I, I'm just talking right now about your first term. You're keeping your ear to the ground. You're learning. You're listening. Uh, did you sponsor any legislation? No. Did any of your constituents ask you to sponsor any no. legislation? I believe one did ask me to legalize the training of coon dogs before the season. But other than that, I don't recall anything. There's not as much interest in the general public in those days as it is now. And there's not a lot now. Uh, once you got there, you, you, re you realized a bit of a dream in that you'd now been elected to the House. Did no, it, I've been trying to get up there since I was six years old. Well, but I mean, you, you now were there. You now you had better. something to do better than hang around the halls. Was it as thrilling as you thought it would be? It was better than I'd ever expected. Okay. I would ever be accomplished. All right. Well, we, we've now brought your story to the beginning of your political career, and I think this is a good time to take a break. So let's do that. This is Dan Pomeroy. Uh, Mr. Barry, we'd like to talk uh, somewhat more about your political career. We talked about uh, you being elected to the legislature, and uh, Frank Governor was Clement. You, Frank Governor was Clement? I mean, Frank Clement was Governor, I'm sorry. Frank Clement was Governor. Uh, you developed a very close relationship with Governor Clement. Uh, how did that come about? Political association. And what do we mean by political association? As against personal uh, familiarity. I was simply in public office at the same time he was, second in line of succession in case there was a vacancy. And uh, our association and friendship was primarily political and personal to some degree. It's better to keep the two spheres separate. Well, he had quite an impact uh, in Tennessee. Some would argue he was the most uh, important governor in the 20th century in terms of state history, but uh, I know it was a turbulent time during part of his tenure with the civil rights uh, uh, activities. Do you have any recollections from that period? Oh, of course. Anything you'd like to share with us? Not necessarily. It was a turbulent time, as you said. Uh, much ill will, some violence. Uh, as you know, a very notable assassination. Uh, we were spared some of the more violent convolutions, for which we were thankful. But I think the government's firm stand uh, in both directions was important. His uh, position on Oak Ridge and other things were in well in advance of, of, of his time. Governor Clement uh, had a very charismatic personality from everything I've known about him. Uh, I understand he was very effective on the campaign trail. Uh, so he must have been. He won three times. Do you think that uh, 
Well, I mean, obviously politics has changed in the television age, but uh, how do you think uh, politics is today compared to then? How, how might he fare today? Methods of communication and uh, addressing the public and involving the public in issues is more pronounced and more important than it's ever been. I have some doubt that his particular style of campaigning would be enthusiastically re received nowadays as it was then. How would you characterize that style of his on the campaign trail? A combination of scholarly approach and the public appeal, emotional type of approach that was a characteristic of the last century in its early years. Uh, his, ra his best efforts were on the stump in front of crowds. One of the more unfortunate aspects of his career was his address to the 1956 Democratic National Convention. It was not well received, but all in all, he was a man of eloquence, a man of knowledge, and had a phenomenal photographic memory, and was also a man who was generous by nature and kindly as well. There seems to be some similarities between his career and yours in that you both had a military experience to draw upon and a law experience to draw upon. Did, that, uh, did you ever see that kindred relationship? Well, if I do, I also reflect on the fact that he was far more successful than I was and deserved to be. So you had politics in common, but, there, but uh, there was also a personal relationship, I assume. We were friends. Uh, when you arrived in Nashville and uh, uh, during your uh, term in the legislature, I'm reminded of uh, Justice Lyle Reed saying when he came to the legislature, uh, that he would walk into his desk and there would be a pile of bills that he was expected to vote on, that there wasn't a whole lot of discussion and back and forth in committee meetings and so forth. How did you see the legislature and the way politics operated change during your tenure in Nashville? There were several different ways. The modernization and the computerization of our society, of course, is a great radical change in every field. <clears throat> I did feel, however, that most of the bills introduced were unnecessary. We had too much legislation. You could read some of them, you considered it very important, and the rest you'd cast into the waste can. That is what I did. Those that I felt were important for the welfare of the state, I studied carefully and tried to prepare myself for. But those I considered to be publicity-seeking or uh, unnecessary, I paid little heed. What was the uh, impact of uh, Baker versus Carr in 1962? Revolutionary. It completely reapportioned the legislature on the basis of one man, one vote. A principle which certainly was not respected or even considered by the United States Senate which uh, ratified and supported this position later on. It, it completely, it did not transfer the control of the House and the Senate in Tennessee to the urban areas as radically as I thought it would. It took a long time. And even now, the rural voice is still heard. But uh, it's not for me to say whether or not it was equitable. I always felt that there should be some consideration given to the lesser government unit, as well as the number of human beings that live in a district. This is the principle of the American Constitution. The House numbers the Senate states. And I thought with that precedent to force, certainly some weight should be given to the rural areas as political entities as against the more populous urban parts of Tennessee. 
Well, you indicated there was less legislation uh, then than there is now. Uh, did you sponsor legislation when you were a member of the House? When I was floor leader of the House in 1959 and 61, and when I was speaker in 63 and 65, I signed all legislation sponsored by the administration as administration bills, which they were. Some of it, I'll admit now, was uh, not significant, but much of it was. What uh, the significant legislation, what impact has that had in Tennessee? It's hard to tell on long range because the circumstances change. Uh, everyone knows the things that Clement accomplished or that he recommended. Vocational schools, junior colleges, the Department of Mental Health, separate and apart from the Health Department, various and sundry other departmental measures that were considered by the commissioners to be important. And another uh, vast group of legislation which common sense would dictate. Every commissioner felt he had to have a government bill or administration bill. Naturally, much of this would be a duplication and unnecessary. But uh, most of the heads of the departments did not consider they'd done their job unless they found something wrong with their own administration and proposed legislation to correct it. There's a certain anomaly there. Uh, he's self-criticism, so to speak. He flagellates himself. Uh, I've always thought that a bit amusing. Oh, by the way, I was wrong about that. We need a bill. Uh, well, you moved up into a leadership position quickly after you got to the uh, House. Uh, what path did you take towards leadership and then towards the speakership? Fast as I could. No, I was uh, a lieutenant to governor, to Lieutenant Governor James L. Bomer, who was Speaker of the House for 10 years and Senate for two. And I sort of grew up in his shadow and had an excellent mentor, I'm proud to say. And I moved more or less into his position when he went to the Senate. Uh, I had been his floor leader and was somewhat considered to be in order of succession. Now, how did you know Lieutenant Governor Bomer? He was speaker when I first went to the legislature in 1955. And we became personal friends and good friends and uh, thought a lot alike. What part of Tennessee was he from? Shelbyville, Marshall County. Hmm. That's the hometown of Governor Prentice Cooper as well, isn't it? It was. And you, you knew Governor Cooper. Uh, I think you have a, a wonderful story when you were in school at Vanderbilt seeing Governor Cooper at the governor's mansion. Uh, let me say first that Governor Cooper was probably one of the most, most honest men that ever served as the governor of Tennessee. Uh, he was not a large man. Uh, he was an only child, which I am, and I understand that. And he lived, of course, in those days out on West End across from Vanderbilt in the governor's residence. And on several occasions, I've seen him out in the front yard of the residence trying to induce and entice his parrot, Laura, to come down out of trees and back into the house. This was not uh, surprising. Every man wants his parrot back in his house, I suppose. But uh, it was quite interesting to watch Governor Cooper perform that task. I admired him very much. I just think that's a wonderful story in these days and times to think about the governor out in the yard with a pet. I don't know how much that occurs now. The governor's so insulated. I don't know either, but it wasn't like that. Well, aside from the legislation, what would be some of your most memorable experiences as speaker? Well, it's a continuing thing. You have to keep on top of it all the time. And I don't think of anything being particularly significant. Like anything else, it's very important to keep in charge of it. Don't let it fall apart. Always 
make sure that if you don't have complete control, you have 99% control. Bear in mind, on one of those occasions, Governor Clement had been defeated for the Senate in the Democratic primary, and that caused a group of oppositionists to spring up in the House and might not have been there before. Uh, we took care of that. Now, when you ceased being Speaker in the, of the House, and uh, how did that come about? What did you do after that? Oh, after I served in that speaker, mm -hmm. I became executive assistant to Governor Ellington, who succeeded Governor Clement from 1967 to 1971. So you must have you must have had a very close relationship with Governor Ellington, closer than with Governor Clement. And how did he was uh, also from Middle Tennessee, I believe, was Marshall he? County, Lewisburg. And did you all, so you met him when you were a member of the legislature? I was his floor leader when he was governor the first time. And uh, what, what did you uh, uh, do with Governor Ellington during those years in terms of legislation? Well, when the legislature was in session, I would screen the bills, having had some experience. And uh, we would have conferences as to whether or not they were desirable. Of course, the administration legislation was desirable. But other, you had to watch out for bills that might have a hidden meaning. But all in all, we had a harmonious legislature most of the time. And uh, I hope, as always, we accomplished some good for the state. When the legislature wasn't in session, uh, uh, what was your uh, function with the administration? I would handle most of the correspondence. I would handle a number of the appointments, most of the prison and penitentiary matters, make speeches. You know, when the governor didn't, didn't want to go somewhere to make a speech, I'd go. And uh, things like that. Uh, I sort of met with foreign visitors, and we have a lot of people from Europe come through, and I would talk to them. And, uh, I had a lot of leisure time, and I didn't do anything. What's your assessment of Governor, Governor Ellington and his impact on the state of Tennessee? He was fortunate in being governor at the time when no radical measures were required or justified. We tried to conduct a safe, sane, orderly, but at the same time effective administration. We did not try to upset any apple carts or cause any serious complications unless they were necessary. Did you find your work with uh, Governor Ellington as rewarding as being Speaker of the House? That would be a difficult comparison to make. As Speaker of the House, you're 100% in charge. As gubernatorial assistant, you're not. I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> you have uh, talked about some of the changes that, uh, that, that took part in that took place in Tennessee uh, during your years in Nashville, and you've often mentioned uh, William Snodgrass and his impact in Tennessee, a man who probably not a whole lot of people know about. What was his impact in state government? Bill Snodgrass was born in 1922. He became state controller of action of the legislature in 1953. And in the intervening years, of his service. His organization, which conducts audit of all the government functions of the state, grew in size and influence. And I would say that his impact on the state over that long period of time was for the good and was greater than that of any other individual except the governors themselves, and often greater than theirs. He was a valuable and important public service servant 
and there will always be a difficulty in comparing others favorably to him. The uh, legislature meets every year now, but for many years they would meet, uh, I believe, only every two years. Is that correct? That is correct. When did that change? That changed at the time they amended the Constitution in 1953, I believe. There were several conditions given that period. Clement used to say that instead of the legislature meeting uh, uh, 75 days every two years, it should meet two days every 75 years. This was said in jest, partly. <laughs> uh, after the administration of Governor Ellington, I believe you went to the Attorney General's office? Right. And what did, what did you do there? Practically nothing. <laughs> uh, why did you uh, leave uh, uh, executive service, or why did, uh, did you determine not to run again for the legislature? I knew I would be defeated if I did. Is that because of the Republican politics here? <laughs> that was part of it, yes. Uh, well, that's a long story, but I had to give up Madison County, which was my stronghold. And I knew that I could go into Governor Edison's office, so I took the line of least resistance. Well, you worked with uh, Attorney General David Pack, I believe. That's correct. And uh, uh, what sort of uh, impact did he have on laws of Tennessee and the people of Tennessee during your time there? The official title is Attorney General and Reporter. The reporter function is very important because that codifies the law and publishes to, uh, to the public. Uh, he, of course, supervises the attorneys who represent the state in litigation. David is one of the most competent men I've ever known. He ran for governor and lost heavily, lost badly. But the state would have been far better off if they had elected him rather than the incumbent, whose name I won't mention, but whose initials were Ray Blanton. <laughs> I remember those tumultuous times. I think there were, how many people, Democrats were running in the primary? It seems to me about 10 or 12, not uh, 74. I tried to help David as I could, but he was not well enough known. Now, uh, this brings us up to 1974. Uh, what public activities have you pursued since then? None, except interest. Well, you mentioned the Tennessee Performing Arts Center. Well, yes, they were not official. So, uh, I was executive, uh, not executive, I was uh, chairman of the Arts Commission for four years, back in the 80s, when it was being organized. And uh, that's about it as far as public involvement is concerned in those years. I had been chairman of the March of Dimes way back in 58 for the state. I had Basil O'Connor down here from New York and all that. And then the March of Dimes, did I say the March of Dimes? The Cancer Crusade for the state in 1965. Uh, other than that, I simply stayed here and pursued the even tenor of my ways. Well, unlike Winfield Dunn, you chose not to stay in Nashville. Well, yes. So why did you decide to come back home to Lexington? For the simple reason I didn't want to stay in Nashville. <laughs> I liked Nashville, I liked to visit it, but this is home. In Henderson County, you served as chairman of the Beach River Watershed Development, I believe. That I did. And what, what did you accomplish with that? I'll let others decide that. 
You know, I think it was beneficial. I believe we can go out and look around and you'll see it's beneficial and has been. But I wouldn't want to say anything too favorable about it myself. I know I'd do it again. My only regret is the government cut out two lakes that we'd hope to get because of cost. Now, uh, how wide ranging is the Beach River watershed? There are probably some of our viewers who are not even going to know what a watershed is. This is quite possible. It is one of the smallest watershed drainage areas in the Tennessee Valley. And for that reason, it was ideal for the government to make an exhibition of it when they created the tributary area development of TVA. It was small, 193,000 acres, more or less. And uh, we had only two counties involved. There was no opportunity for argument or difference of opinion among the governing body. And ours turned out to be rather successful. A lot of the other watersheds, and there are quite a number in the Tennessee Valley, uh, started out optimistically, but fell to the wayside often because there were too many counties involved. So this is when smallness is better, and that has made the path easier for us. But I regret that no other, with the possible exception of Elk and Duck, who finally gave up uh, rivers, uh, chose to follow the same policy and to reap the same benefits. Well, during your long and distinguished career, you've obviously known and interacted with many other political and social leaders, aside from the ones we've talked about here. Uh, do you have any obs other observations in that regard you'd like to share with us? I'd have to go through the list and purge. <laughs> oh, there have been many politics and government made lighter by a sense of humor funny things happen. They do happen. But I could not give you a categorical description of the hundreds and thousands of situations I've been involved in. Like anything else in life, if you have a sense of humor, it makes everything so much easier. And I hope someday the world will learn that. Do you have, uh, in terms of uh, recollections and your long memory of Tennessee politics, do you have uh, observations on uh, the Gore family or Governor Bredesen? I always thought that Phil Bredesen was a good governor. He was a man of independent means. He was not beholden to anyone. And I thought the state was well served by his time in office. I have no comment on the Gores. Perhaps uh, Governor Alexander or now Senator Alexander, we haven't mentioned him. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> and I know better than to ask you anything about Governor Ray Blanton. <laughs> Great tragedy. Uh, is there anything else I, we haven't asked you about that we should? That's for you to decide. <laughs> and as a, as a uh, final question, uh, how would your, you like posterity to remember your service? I suppose for the watershed project here in Lexington and Henderson County, Decatur County. We'll leave that up. Of course, I'll be forgotten. That's how I'll be remembered. Most everybody is in politics. All right. Thank you, sir. My pleasure.
Mr. Barry, we're doing tag team interview today, and as uh, someone mentioned, that I'm going to do the redirect examination of you and follow up on a few things uh, that I heard Dan mention. Uh, you were elected to the legislature in 1954, and at that time you were a, shall we call you a garden variety, newly elected member of the House, and you were interested in getting into leadership. So what was your path to leadership? What was the next job within the legislature that you had? Although I guess one of the things you had to be sure of was to keep being reelected in your hometown. I only had opposition one time it was of a serious nature. That was from a man in Madison County who, of course, was from a populous county, four times the population of this one. And I won rather handily, three to two there and two to one here. He later became a very good friend, and he recently died. He was a judge, Joe Morris. Mm. And uh, other than that, I made it a point of always knowing what the legislation dealt with and being able to explain it, because I was floor leader. I, I was in charge of keeping the majority like a whip is now, really. And, uh, How do you become floor leader? Whose decision is that? In those days, it was the governor because you handle his program. It's not necessarily a power matter. It's just a matter that he's the one that would naturally recommend, as the president does. Remedial or other uh, desirable legislation he considers justified. So he looked over who was in the legislature and the governor picked you. That with would be, that, that's the presumption. In consult consultation with the Speaker of those days. And who was the Speaker? James L. Bomer of Chabot. Okay. And uh, of course they have their own confidential discussions about these matters. And uh, what I wanted was to be in a position to be in charge. I like to be in charge. So did you go from floor leader to Speaker? That's correct. Now, to get to be Speaker, that is a vote of your peers, correct? Not exactly. It's the vote of your caucus group, or they're representing your party. The Democrats nominated me, and then having the majority, they elected me. Okay, so to, to be nominated by the Democrats, you had to be well-liked by your cohorts? We went by the Hermitage Hotel the night before and signed a petition. That made, the sheriff, made sure the Republicans wouldn't have any power. This was always done. Same way the chief clerk and uh, two or three of the other clerical personnel. And yes, uh, so it's a party matter. Do you, would you characterize yourself as well-liked by your fellow House members? By some. By some, OK. Did you, it's um, more important to be feared. Feared? Yeah. How do, you inspi how do you inspire, is that the right word, fear? How do you it instill fear? It makes afraid they'll embarrass themselves if you let them. But if you keep control of things, you, you'll be all right. You don't have them jumping up and uh, raising questions very often if they know you're going to control it anyway. And that's what I always sought to do. Uh, when legislators are in Nashville, they work, shall we say, during the day, and they're known, or at least they used to be known, to play at night. There's some reputation of that effect. Not always justified. Were uh, you, did you go out to dinner four nights a week with members of the legislature? No, I always had prayer meetings at 6 o'clock. Are you being facetious? I am. Tell me what prayer meeting really means. Well, there again, you have a condemnatory attitude toward the legislators. This is not justified because when you say they are playboys or whatever they said now, you're reflecting on the people who evaluated them and sent them to Nashville to represent them. That is the general public. So I make it a point, rather than making fun of the legislators at their pastimes, make fun of the public who sent them that. I, yeah. I don't, I'm, tr I'm not trying to cast aspersions. I'm indicating that personal relationships help the business get done. 
and that personal relationships good are often yeah. formed by social interaction, which, and, and there you are in Nashville, there the members are in Nashville, and the day's work is done, and they have an evening. And so I'm not indicating they did anything wrong, but did you have dinner nightly with members, other she's, members? She's right good at that, right good. No, I don't eat dinner hardly at all. I eat very light dinner. And I found that if you, I can think of, if you food your rice too much, it's bad. If too little, it's bad. So I tried to strike a happy balance. I didn't go out to the 4, 12 club or whatever. I didn't uh, socialize very much. Were the, was the profession of lobbyist as prominent then? Oh, heavens no. No. Oh, no. You only had a few lobbyists that were very active. The Teachers Association, the Teachers Union, as it was called, the Farm Bureau, uh, soft drink industry, the hard drink industry, uh, other lobbying groups representing occupations and so forth. But nowhere near as many as proliferate now. Uh, it's too, it's too, too, it's too much now. It's far too much. What about staff? Did you have staff? Two secretaries. Both in Nashville or one at home and one in Nashville? No, if you let them have stay at home, they'll wear them to death. Uh, we had both of them in Nashville. So you had no one on the ground to kind of keep their his or her ear to what your constituents were saying during the legis legislative session? I doubt if many of them said anything, but no, I didn't pay a particular mind to that, really. Did Unless they rose up in some righteous anger when I did listen. Uh, did, um, did you ever have a desire to be a member of the Tennessee Senate? No, not the Senate. No. Why? No, no. Just always going to the House. Don't really know. Also, it was not practical because the district included several more counties in addition to my own House district. Uh, no, I was uh, the House was enough for me. And, and so you, you told me you served from 1954 to 1967. Hmm. And in 67, what happened that made you leave the House? I knew I'd get defeated in the next election. So you looked around for something else to do? No, I knew what I was going to do. Okay. And actually, I've, I'm sorry, I've skipped something. You wanted to work your way through the leadership of the House, and in 1960. Four, you became speaker, is that correct? Sixty-three. Sixty-three. Mm -hmm. So that was you had achieved your goal. I had achieved more than I ever expected to achieve. I was satisfied. And so you spent four years, approximately four years, three or four years as speaker. That's right. Mm -hmm. What what in polite company were you called Speaker Barry? Is that the correct? As far as I know, that's that, the, that's the title. Yeah. Is that the correct title? It was called anybody who was speaker by whatever name it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did Like uh, General Spatz in the Air Force. His wife took a name out of his name, his personal name. Instead of saying S-P-A-A-C-S, -A -A -S, she didn't want it pronounced as Spatz, so she called it Spots. So whoever is the speaker is going to be called the speaker. And, and did the members call you Mr. Speaker? When I heard them. Okay. <laughs> did you wield that oversized gavel? No, I never had one of those. No need for it. I broke several, but they were ordinary gavels. And yes, they are. If they get out of line, you have to hammer them, which is Monday night after dinner. Um. So you, you achieved, in a short period of time, what you had wanted since you were a child. That's what it When matters. you got there, was it as great as you thought it would be? Oh, yeah. I enjoyed it. Did you do any traveling around Tennessee as speaker? Um, yes. Uh, speaking and conducting uh, meetings, filling in for the governor sometimes. Of course, everybody was disappointed when I did, but uh, they didn't raise much question. Um, 
had you, I know you traveled the world, had you seen much of the other parts of Tennessee before you did that? Well, not as much, of course, but not as much in East Tennessee. Educated in Vanderbilt and lived in West Tennessee. Right. East Tennessee looks very different than West Tennessee. Oh, yeah. Much more different. mountainous. Oh, sure. Um, and at the time you were speaker, again, I, I apologize if we've asked you this before, who was the governor? Uh, Frank Clement, the first uh, four years, and Buford Eddington, the second four years. At that time, gubernatorial terms were how long? Until 1953, they were two, to two years with a limit of three terms, or six years. And after 53, there were four two-year terms. Later on, they amended it to provide for two-year terms the other, the other way around, and uh, one four-year term and then a skip. Now it can be two, two, two four-year terms. Okay, so while you were speaker... Two years. There was Governor Clement... Now they were four years. And Governor Ellington. Right. Clement was elected in 52 and served his first term until 54, 55, 54. Yeah, that's right. Um, what, what was the difference in the two men? They're both Democrats. Were they similar in age? I don't know. Governor Clement was born in 1920, Governor Eddington born in 1907. Uh, they were, in many ways, similar. But uh, Governor Clement would say perhaps he had more formal education. Governor Eddington had learned a lot about people during his relatively brief career. Uh, they were both honorable men. Unfortunately, they had some difference of opinion about personal matters. And there was a unhealthy jealousy to some degree between them for various reasons. But I can honestly say that, in my opinion, the state was better off for both of them having dedicated their lives to public service. When the governorship went back and forth between these two Democratic governors, was there a wholesale turnover in the governor's cabinet and other leadership, even though it was going from one Democrat to another? No, there were some changes, but not many it was between the two. And those that did leave often left for other reasons. There were some discharges among personnel, of course. But uh, a number of the commissioners stayed on through both administrations. And when one was out of office and the other one was in office, was the one out of office attempting to undermine the one in office? No, there wasn't any of that. There was some bit of fear, some, some animosity, but not anything that was manifest. If, so in 1967, when you saw that, that it was possible that you were going to lose your legislative seat. I knew it was certain. All right. <laughs> when you were certain you were going to lose your legislative seat, Buford Ellington was governor, correct? He was ending his term, yeah. Okay. He was ending his term? No, he was beginning, beginning his term. Beginning his term. And so a job with him was, was a certainty for you? It was likely. Okay. If Clement had been governor, would the circumstances have been the same? Who can say? Okay. <laughs> okay. I think probably so, uh, but I don't know. There were complications. All right, so you left the legislature. Did you resign or did your term end? And you the didn't term ended. Again? Your term ended, mm -hmm. and you went to work for the governor. That's correct. In the Capitol building? Oh, yes. And uh, you had your fingers in a lot of pies, and you substituted for the governor when necessary. Did you represent Tennessee nationally? Oh, yeah, about a time or two. I went up to Montreal to that World's Fair they had back in the 60s. Coldest place I was ever in. <laughs> and little things, this and that. Went to the Democratic National Convention as a delegate. And mostly I stayed around the Capitol. 
uh, I didn't hang around the residents and all that. I left that to others. Where did you live in those years? Well, there were two apartment houses. One is Capitol Towers, and uh, what Manor, Metro Manor, right at the foot of the hill there, for the Capitol. Uh, I still had apartments there in those two buildings. And were you there year round, or only when? Uh, I kept it year round. Of course, I wasn't up there. I mean, I was with the governor. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was. Okay. But uh, when I was speaking, I didn't have occasion to be up there as much as they do now. And what, uh, how did it look from the other side of the street? How did the legislature look to you? Did you miss it? Oh, yes, yeah, I did, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. No, I, I was learning the legislature when I was in school, a child, of course. I knew something about it before I went. But, uh, yes, I miss it. I still do. Um, Buford Ellington's term ended, and he could not succeed himself, is that correct? He served two four-year terms. Okay, and there was no thought that he would sit out for four years and run again? No, he died the next year. Um, so as his term is ending, were you looking around for something else to do? No, I'm lazy by nature. So and I was looking for nothing else, I was tired. I didn't want to do it. And how old were you? Oh, mercy, mercy. 41. 40. So, I'm, I'm, help me here. When uh, were you in the Attorney General's office? 1971 to 1973. So, 1974. Was, was that after your time with right. Governor Ellington? That's correct. So, you did take another job? Well, yes, for three years. And what was your portfolio with the Attorney General? Very little. Didn't do much. Well, are you just a great guy to have around? Well, I don't know about that. I've never been hit by tomatoes or hit by uh, snowballs or anything like that. So why did the Attorney General hire you? You have to ask the Attorney General. Buddy. Well, he, we can't do that. So why do you think the Attorney General hired you? I guess he just liked me. Well, I guess you're a great guy to have around. Well, that may be, but some of the others up there that did work didn't like it. Don't blame them. But, uh, you you were not in you you were not acting as an attorney general. No, I never filed a brief. Okay, so what was your portfolio there? Mm, I'm trying to think of what I did. I did something, I'm sure. Uh, not much. Did you, did, were you, did you hang at the legislature? And, no, and, I never went back after I left the house. So you were at the AG's office on a daily basis? <clears throat> yes, that's correct. But you, you cannot tell us what you were doing? Well, I could, and there's nothing to be ashamed of, but I didn't do much. <laughs> the reason I didn't do much is I don't like to work. All right. I like to play politics. So Pack and I got along just fine. He had his own reasons, I think. So you kept your ear to the ground and spoke when spoken to and provided advice? Now you're putting words in my I mouth. I am because I'm not getting words out of you. Precisely. And I know that. All right. Okay, so if you, you were lucky enough to be hired by a man you admired, who was the Attorney General, and you weren't having to work too hard, uh, why did that end? He ran for governor. And, and which meant he left the attorney general's office? Oh, sure. Okay. What did he do after <coughs> he was not nominated? Practice law in Nashville. Okay. So that was kind of the end of your opportunity there. And at that time you came back to Lexington? That's right. Okay. So you were in your mid-40s? There's some theory on the part of people that everybody likes to work. I don't like to all right, well then I'm gonna ask you a personal question. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of people work to secure income to, to, to carry on. Uh, how is it that you were able to 
uh, continue in life in the style to which you'd become accustomed without working? Of course, my great grandfather did work. And and provided funds that 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 still provide for you today. There's a little scratch, I would say. Yes, okay. I haven't spent it all. All right. And uh, since you've come back to Lexington, you have um, aided our state, I guess, in non-paying, non nine to five jobs. You're right about that. Okay, so you were involved with the State Museum? With, yes, with the, the uh, Dan didn't Arts pay Center, me anything much. With the Performing Arts Center? No, I was chairman of that. And getting that built, I gather. Or was it already it. built? No, my thing was built it. The rest of it was just some of hangers on. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, other civic activities? Yes, yeah, some civic activities. Okay. A lot of no activity at all. <laughs> but but yet you tell me that you don't have a television, which is what a lot of people fill their days with. So tell me, how have you filled your days? I read a lot. And are there specific topics you like to read about? Oh, sure, everybody does. It reads it all. What do you read about? Mostly English history and things of that nature, European history. Not a lot that uh, we know about this country is young. No, I just enjoy reading. And I was in my father's newspaper office so long that reading second nature to me. And I don't think of anything else. Uh, uh, and how do you select the books that you read? Those that sound like they'd be of considerable interest. Uh, I believe you told me you're a member of a book club that sends you uh, praises and then you select from them? That's correct. Do you use a computer? No, heavens, no. Okay. So you're not getting your books through Amazon? Uh, whatever Amazon is, I don't get any books from them. All right. And uh, how many books do you have going at one time? Never more than two. What about periodicals? What do you read? Bye bye. Uh, newspapers, magazines? What, what oh, do you I read? Oh, I beg your pardon. Periodicals. Uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Election and Progress. Uh, one or two periodical, uh, non daily and non monthly, just uh, commemorative things and things about organizations I'm interested in. That's about it. I believe you told me you like The Economist. I do. It's the best news magazine available. And you. Um the one thing I, I want to go back to, and, and I'm afraid I'm a city girl, you talked about your pride and your work in the watershed. I still don't understand what is a watershed and what did you create? The watershed is the area of a river valley from which the rainfall drains. It's like that. And here's a range of hills, another range of hills. It flows into a more a larger stream, usually navigable. And the area that it drains is called the watershed. And our purpose here was to build lakes where hollows and low areas existed. We built seven. They were flooded, dammed up and flooded. And they produced, uh, in one case, a thousand acres of water, which is a lot for a country town. And we built a couple of hundred of 250 residences, some of them in the million dollar range around the shores of these lakes. There are also recreational activities by boaters and skiers and such. And the main thing, whereas the town of Lexington, which furnishes the water supply for the county, had a maximum capacity before we built the lake of 750,000 gallons a day. Now it's 5 million, of which we use about 3 million, so at this point. And that, and along with uh, our water supply, uh, that's what we produced by damming these lakes and creating the water, watershed bodies. It's the same principle of water seeking its own level. You couldn't have put it anywhere but where we did because that's where the hills were. Like Willie Sutton said, that's where the money is. And uh, you couldn't very well build a lake on top of a mountain unless it was a very large expanse of land. 
uh, connected with it. So that was the basic theory behind it. So it's both for water use and for recreation mm -hmm. and residential use, uh -huh. drinking water supply, industrial development, mm -hmm. irrigation if needed, <coughs> and um, yes, whatever I have water is useful. That's why we try to take it. So it's not a damming of a river. A creek, usually a smaller body. Okay, so it's not the Tennessee River we're talking about. No, no, about. that's uh, that's the parent water. The, this, this, area, this, these little creeks flow into the river, okay. and we have five of them here, <coughs> and they've been uh, very well received by the natives. Okay, that I thank you for explaining that to the to to me, um, and so you've enjoyed the last number of years uh, putting your attention into things that interested you like the watershed, like yeah. the Performing Arts Center, uh, other charitable endeavors and, and spending your days in this lovely house in this uh, bucolic area reading. The last of life of which the first is made. Um, is there any advice you could give to people who are interested in legislation that is now, uh, or interested in le legislation that now exists, or interested in introducing legislation in the Tennessee legislature? I rarely offer advice because it's frequently disregarded. And I also don't know what I'm talking about unless I'm closely connected. I'm not great on advice. I don't like to get it, and I don't like to give it. So I'll let everyone decide for himself. Okay. And I forgot to put my hands up to my mouth. Um, and is there anything else that you would like me to ask you, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? No, you've covered the territory pretty well, I'd say. Okay. You sure you're not a lawyer yourself? <laughs> I'm afraid I am. I thought you were. All right. <laughs> Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. It's a pleasure. <laughs>